so thanks very much Lachlan um, for that generous introduction and also to ESO in collaboration with the Italian Research Seminar for the invitation to present the Oxford Handbook of Dante this evening, particularly among so many friends and colleagues. Um, it's really such a pleasure for us, all three of us really, to have this opportunity um, in dialogue, we hope, with also some of our contributors who could be here this evening. And since the, you know, the handbook has been such a collaborative endeavour from the word go, we really wanted to take this opportunity to thank our contributors for their really wonderful um, and important contributions, given that the substance of this volume is really thanks to them, and it wouldn't even exist if it were not for this, you know, really brilliant amount of scholarship that's that's managed to come together in this in this one book. And as I said, some of them are here this evening, and we're really delighted that um, at least some could be present in in this remote format. Um, and last, by no means least, we wanted to thank all of the public who've come along um, this evening. And it's really, you know, such a, a pleasure to have a chance to speak to you really also relatively soon after the volume has come out. And it's a, an opportunity for us to kind of reflect back and, and think together about, about the project. And, you know, as we've said, and, and we hope it will be clear, um, this has been really a collective project from the beginning, and it's remained so in, in lots of different ways. And now that you know it's it's come to fruition, um, our hope is really to pass this volume on to our readers um, in the hope that they can then transform the book and, in a Dantian way, give it a vita nova, like a new life um, in their own in their own readings. So the Oxford Handbook of Dante is, is, as you might expect, closely connected to Oxford, but it's also a very international volume, and it's come out of a long-standing collaboration between the three editors, so between me, um, Elena. And, and Lele, and it's continued in a similarly collaborative, um, dialogic and, and plural mode. And the volume itself, which I'm fortunate to say I even have here to show you, um, this, this, this volume is composed of 44 um, essays and is almost 800 pages long, that, meaning that actually this evening we can't go into detail, unfortunately, about the individual contributions, which, as, as we've said and as we hope you'll see, are really, you know, wonderful and, and so complex um, and beautiful in their own right. But what we'll aim to do instead is to give you an overview um, of, the, of the volume, say something about how the project kind of came into being, how we then conceived the handbook itself, and what we've tried to do um, in, in shaping um, this, this, this Dante. And what we're going to do is actually take turns in speaking. So I'm obviously starting, but I will then pass to Elena and, and Lily will also speak. And we're trying to keep as agile a format as possible. Um, and, and as um, Lachlan mentioned, we'd be really delighted to have comments, questions, and a chance to dialogue with one another at the end um, of our presentation. So as I said, the book, the handbook um, of Dante, the Oxford handbook came out actually very recently on the 25th of March. Um, and some of you may actually have already come across the Oxford handbooks, um, but for those of you who, for whom it may be um, fairly sort of or newer, um, we thought we'd just say a little bit about the series and then how this sort of, we saw this fitting into that. So the handbooks were published by Oxford University Press and they aim to bring together specialists on specific topics. Um, some of these are kind of author topics, others are um, kind of, you know, concepts or um, really relevant um, recent ideas. So you could think of, you know, Aristotle or Aquinas or Shakespeare or Cervantes, but that would be just to name a few examples from Western literature. Um, and there's very many other um, sort of areas and disciplines across which the series ranges, and that includes science, social science, and then, you know, humanities in the broadest sense. And the idea of the handbooks is really to produce academic articles of a high level that give a sense of the state of the field from um, ideally a sort of global perspective, but certainly opening up um, ideas and avenues for, for, pu for possible future um, areas of research. And the contributions in the volume, um, as you probably understood, are actually written specifically for it. And they're aimed at researchers in a particular field, which for us was Dante studies, but also I think we thought more broadly also of medieval studies. Um, and then and that opened up in turn to a range of other disciplines because of that, of course, Dante allows that, that ranging across many different areas of thought and the history of thought. So the project itself began back in 2015 um, through actually Martin McLaughlin's initiative um, when we were contacted by Oxford University Press to see if we'd be interested in editing a handbook um, of Dante. 
And we have to admit that at the beginning, we were a little bit um, hesitant and also anxious because we imagined that it would be a colossal undertaking. They were actually perhaps not as colossal as it turned out to be. So that was maybe actually with hindsight when one might even say that it was it was bigger than it seemed. Um, but then we did think that working together with three of us, that it might actually be possible. And we actually allowed ourselves to be swayed by the enthusiasm for the project and the idea of being able to give shape to what we came to call kind of our Dante or the Dante that we could see emerging um, out of this this set of texts, this text of texts. Um, and this idea of giving shape to a Dante, um, of, you know, a particular kind of Dante was important. And it's in line with the idea that the structure of a work actually has a fundamental role in determining the image of an author that emerges from it. Um, and it's a concept that for those of you who are studying or researching Dante um, will will know is you know, can be thought of um, particularly in relation to the operation of the Vita Nova, and Lele has worked on this um, particularly. But the Vita Nova, when it gathers 31 of Dante's previously um, authored lyric poems um, and orders them in a particular way and comments, the author comments on them through um, the introduction of a prose narrative, so in, in a hybrid prosimetric structure, this actually gives the poems a different meaning from the one that they had previously. In, insofar as then the figure of Dante that emerges from this, what we might call the textual operation of the Vita Nova, is actually radically different from the one that we would find, for example, in Dante's Rime, the unanthologized lyric texts, where if you like, a different author emerges, or we might say actually, um, you know, doesn't emerge because they're unanthologized and deliberately um, in this kind of sense of not being a coherent whole. So reflecting on how we could organize, you know, the handbook coming back to the project itself, we really thought about then what kind of Dante um, we wanted to emerge out of, out of this volume. And so we came up with a detailed proposal that we submitted to the press, um, to the external reviewers. And we again began to think about um, <clears throat> who could write the various chapters that we'd envisaged and sort of envisioned putting into this, this work. And of course, this was a very difficult um, part of the process because there are just so many um, interesting and, and, and really wonderful scholars working on so many different areas of, of Dante um, and related fields. Um, and really one of the principal criteria that guided us in this part was really the one of inviting specialists who could explore the richness of Dante's oeuvre and represent a plurality of interpretations um, that hit that, you know, Dante's that work as a whole is fostered in all these different disciplinary and geographical contexts. So an important criterion overall was the one of plurality, um, and that included several kinds of plurality, the one of disciplinary fields. So we've mentioned Dante studies and, of course, Italian studies would be the other major um, area. But of course, also we could add philology, philosophy, theology, law, um, English and French studies, cinema and the visual arts, medieval Latin, gender studies, post and decolonial um, and queer studies. Also important was an idea of a plurality of belongings an academic formation. So we find contributions here that, that represent, if you like, the UK, um, the USA and North America more broadly, um, Italy, France, Spain, Germany, Switzerland and Canada. And often, just like the editors, many of the authors are, are what we might call sort of hybrids in the sense that they move between different countries and languages. And then finally, we, we thought it was important to represent a plurality of career stages. So um, from you know very established scholars who are already considered leaders in the field, um, some of whom had been our, our mentors and, and, and teachers, but also colleagues of um, our generation, as well as early career researchers. And so the Dante that emerges from the handbook in this sense is first and foremost a plural Dante, um, being both varied and, and various. And uh, um, so on the one hand, um, our desire was always to bring together in a single volume all these different traditions of scholarship in order, as Francesca said, to open up um, dialogues and encounter encounters. But another very important consideration for us was how to situate the handbook and its scholarship within the field of Dante's criticism and in relations to the uh, anniversary celebration. Um, 
This year is, as you know very well, the 700 years since Dante's death. And um, OUP um, asked us to produce the handbook also because of the forthcoming anniversary. And, and to be really honest, that made us a little bit anxious um, because anniversaries tend to be uh, appropriated, institutionalized somewhat. Um, and sometimes they, um, this, this appropriation, this institutional appropriation reinforces uh, nationalism uh, or tends to set writers on a, on a pedestal or to build monuments to them. And and now we have on the on the screen just to to remind ourselves of what this you know attitude can do the the horrendous monument of uh, of Dante in Santa Croce, which was made for the anniversary of 1865. Um, uh, Dante, que, uh, you know, so so an angry, uh, surly, warlike, uh, domineering type of Dante, uh, a tamer of eagles, uh, and of course the eagle here is for the empire, which of course Dante did not tame at all in his life. Um, uh, he had, as you know very well, Dante had no luck in his uh, political ideas in his life, but here is represented as um, taming uh, the eagle. And, and what I love of this picture, I, I don't know if you can see it, but there is that, yeah, there it is. There is this very, this little cheeky pigeon uh, who kind of looks up, very perplexed uh, at Dante, and it's a perfect counterpart, I find, to the very serious eagle. And, and so it, it's, it's a bit of a saving us from all this sort of imperialism on the part of Dante. And we all hope there is a little bit of a scene like in Aristophanes' uh, birds uh, and that the little bird takes revenge on all this human arrogance. Eh? Um, and as you know, some kind of monumentalism of this kind has emerged also this time around. Um, you will have seen the polemics around Dante as the national author, Dante as the father of the Italian language, the uh, polemics that then on the media try to pin nation against nation. It was really um, worrying, but were not embarrassing. Uh, but we must say that at the end, we found that, that the Italian uh, creativity, perhaps the Italian very unruliness, l'ingovernabilità italiana, um, have actually brought us uh, a rather um, postmodern event at uh, the anniversary for those of you who have followed it around the 25th of March was a really strange um, entertaining um, event with the odd absurdity but also many interesting moment uh, the, the the odd the really odd absurdity for me was a patisserie in Naples that made a gigantic Easter egg with the face of Dante on it. Um, and also I read, but very cursorily, that uh, a copy of the comedy written on, say, titanium and has now been sent to space. But I don't know if this is fake news or whatever, but there were actually very interesting moments in the anniversary. Um, so what we try to do, and as you will see, um, in our introduction, we uh, try to bring out instead the strangers, strangeness of anniversaries, and this one in particular, anniversaries which celebrate so publicly an event as intimate as uh, someone's death, a death that comes to Dante in exile, exhausted, thin, macro, Mm, he calls himself, shaken by many years of wandering, um, a poet who had lost his political hopes, uh, uh, so no taming of the empire or of the church, and any hope at that point of returning to Florence. Um, a poet that had just completed uh, that uh, rebellious um, at time obscene and all over heterodox work, the Commedia, the Commedia which probably he never saw uh, 
legata con amore in un volume, so bound together, <coughs> excuse me, in one single work. So is this image um, of the vulnerable Dante that inspired the method of our handbook. Um, the idea that went against the grain of bringing to light this sense of, of vulnerability also in the work itself. So we understand vulnerability as also as openness uh, to interpretation and porosity of reading. And this is against the grain because uh, a lot of Dante scholarship today tends to regard Dante as a strong author, an author completely in control of his text and the text interpretation. Um, a Dante who dictates um, the biography of his life through his work in, a, in, in, in such a pervasive manner that we end up uh, believing it. And, and this biography, a bibliobiography, is then in terms seen as a sort of a progressive uh, march toward some telos, some, some end, a sort of a race towards some kind of religious pinnacle, which is not only um, of little interest at the start of the third millennium, but that wasn't always reflected in the culture of Dante's own time, a culture that was secular as well as religious, and that was much more complex and nuanced than we find uh, in the manuals of the theologians and preachers. A culture of poets, of merchants, of mystics, of troubadours, a, 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 a plurilingual and polycentric culture that we have tried to capture in the handbook. Francesca, to you. See. Grazie. So now we just thought we'd kind of take you, and unfortunately this will be fairly fast, but just show you, um, really give you an overview of how the handbook is structured. Um, and to start really with the cover of the book. Um, so here we really wanted to sort of draw your attention to the image, which um, some of you may recognise. It comes from the Holcomb manuscript that dates from the late 14th century that's held by the Bodleian Library. Um, and this is the eagle in the heaven of Jupiter, the heaven of justice. Um, and we really felt, I mean, the reason we, we liked this image so much was it seemed to really capture something of this collective enterprise, this pursuit of knowledge that came through this very dialogic and plural mode that we've, you know, really tried to kind of um, to work with and practice in, in, in putting together the, the handbook of um, Dante with all our contributors somehow here um, in this, in this marvellous kind of um, endeavour. So in terms of how the, the, the handbook is then structured, um, you'll see if you if you open it that it has seven sections preceded um, by an introduction. And the introduction, um, and it sort of speaks to what Elena was just mentioning, um, we've called it sort of Dante Unbound, a vulnerable life in the openness of interpretation. Um, and this really is our sort of, we give a kind of non-heroic kind of biography of Dante and really try to talk about um, some of the criteria that underpin then the way in which the handbook unfolds um, from that point onwards. So then just to take you briefly through the sections and we'll dwell on, on the last section a little bit more towards the end. So the first section um, is entitled Texts and Textuality and, and really for us Dante is above all a question of, of texts and it was important to us that the handbook should open with a, a section that really analysed Dante's texts in the context of late medieval textuality, um, engaging with questions then of authoriality, practices of reading, composition and production, um, the role of memory, manuscript transmission, the materiality of the text, um, commentary, critical editions, and all the ectoptic and hermeneutic possibilities that have been opened up also recently by digital resources. Um, and you see here, we've just put on the slide um, the names of our contributors and their um, their titles. And as I said, I'm sorry that we can't dwell on, on each of these individual contributions, but we did want to acknowledge um, the really the, the wealth of, um, of ideas um, that went into all of these um, chapters. 
So then from text and textuality, the second section um, is, is dialogues. Um, and this section really deals with what we would normally think of or call sort of intertextuality. So still very much connected to, to textuality in, 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 in that sense. Um, and here the emphasis is on the idea that Dante's texts are not closed entities, but rather come to be constituted through a constant and a persistent dialogue with other texts and cultures to which they are open and receptive. And indeed, it's this extraordinary receptivity of Dante's text that we really wanted to bring out um, through the contributions that make up this part. And you can see um, the kinds of, you know, ranging um, across traditions and, and, um, and cultures here in this, in this section on dialogues. The third section then um, in, 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 in this part three um, of the handbook, um, which we've called Transforming Knowledge, um, this section really explores Dante's profound intellectual commitment and his dedication to the transmission and elaboration of knowledge throughout the arc of his production. So from you know, the Vita Nova, but even as a lyric poet already, through to the Commedia, from the Monarchia to the Questio d'Acque Terra. And um, already as a lyric poet, Dante began to open himself, as you may know, up to scholastic um, ideas, to scholastic philosophy, to contemporary science, particularly medical discourse, dedicating himself um, wholly then to these forms of knowledge after his exile in works like the Convivio and the De Vulgari Eloquencia, and then he reconfigures them in some truly original ways in, in the Commedia. So in a constant dialogue also between Latin and, and vernacular culture, between the sacred, the secular and the political dimensions, Dante is on the one hand extremely receptive to existing forms of knowledge. And, and you know, that was important to kind of also recognise. So readers can, can really find, you know, if they want to read about the law, they can find a chapter on, you know, on legal thoughts in this time. So Dante is on the one hand extremely receptive to these, you know, these ideas um, that are there um, in, in his own time. But on the other, he's profoundly bold and, and really creative. Even, you know, Ulyssean, one might say, in the way that he transforms um, many of these ideas. And he gives them in a highly sort of original and innovative configuration in, in his different works often bound up with the linguistic and the poetic medium through which they are articulated. So um, you can see here the kinds of knowledges and it's really, you know, we could even call it transforming knowledges in the plural. There's really a plurality here too. And, and probably here what, you know, you can see that we felt it was also important and, and interesting to have an entry on poetry within an idea of transforming knowledge so that, you know, we see poetry for Dante not just as a question of, say, it could be rhetoric or style, but also really that poetry is a form or a mode of, of knowledge, a way of thinking and, and transforming it. Then moving on to the fourth section, um, spaces and places, this really wanted to kind of um, convey the idea of Dante being a poet um, who's always in motion and yet always also in place. And this section acknowledges then the situated character of Dante's works and of the author himself, as well as his often or, or almost always being between places. And the chapters in this section, which you see listed here, concentrate on, on how space and place are articulated in Dante's works and how these same places can shape textual identities, but also often unsettle them. And this section reveals a Dante then who is not only aiming at progression, which is often the way that, you know, Dante also, you know, can be read and, and you know, many elements do have this kind of, um, you know, movement sort of forward to converge to an end point, but also recognising that there are a lot of um, other elements that that are within this, you know, what Ellen was talking about, this sort of polycentric and very um, hybrid um, universe. And, and this includes, you know, kind of modes that are more like expansive or they deal with extension, with momentum and also with counter motion. And um, just, you know, out of, of this selection, um, also, you know, each of these um, sections is so rich, um, but there's at the beginning of the of the chapter on traveling, wandering, and mapping, um, it, it begins with an epigraph from um, from Ozip um, Mandelstam, who, in his essay on a conversation about Dante, once asked himself, and he says that he asks this question quite seriously: How many sandals did Alighieri wear out in the course of his poetic work? wandering about the goat paths of, of Italy. So really this idea that this is also a poet who, you know, is, is you know, when he's in exile, really moving and wandering um, about and, and the kinds of, you know, the ways in which that can also destabilise some of, you know, at least some of the image that we might have of this very sort of um, 
kind of yeah like uh, sort of stable or, or fixed a more fixed um, view then moving on to the next section um, which we've called passionate selfhood so this section with four um, essays concentrates on the forms of subjectivity articulated in Dante's works and one can say that you know it's something that we've all three of us have really thought about also in our own research but you know Dante's idea of the self as somehow although it's always also in motion, um, does seem to be situated in some ways, you know, between a kind of a, a more medieval idea of a collective or universal sense of identity, perhaps more typical of the Middle Ages, and then a more modern idea that would be opening up to the idea of a more individual um, or, or, you know, sort of, um, yeah, like consolidated sense of self. And with the title of this section, we really wanted to underline the fundamental role um, that desire and particularly passion plays in, in all of Dante's oeuvre, whether one's talking about his representation um, of, um, of, you know, his relationship with Beatrice from the Vita Nova through to the Paradiso, um, the way that he theorizes the illustrious vernacular in the De Vulgari and then, you know, embraces um, and, and writes um, plurilinguistically in the Commedia, um, also considering the, the mystical dimension of Dante's texts and the encounter with the divine, um, the relationship between desire and the body as being, you know, very sort of central um, in the way that, um, you know, Dante's thinking about, about selfhood and particularly the embodied self um, can, can both define and, and sort of, again, destabilise notions of subjectivity and selfhood across, across Dante's works, and that this also contributes to an idea of an open, often to an open textuality, um, and something really very dynamic in Dante's texts. Um, and again, as an example of kind of, you know, the dialogues that are, you know, our contributors were so receptive to kind of you know, dialoguing with one another and also bringing the way we could bring things together. You know, we have um, an essay on the mystical by one of the foremost, um, you know, critics on on on, on mysticism in the Middle Ages um, next to um, a, a, an essay, which is still one of my favourite titles, I think, Bodies on Fire, um, which really, you know, considers um, the role of the body um, in Dante's, like, you know, also the connecting back to eschatological anthropology um, in, in his eschatological thinking, um, and also with, um, in reference to, to ideas around, um, you know, queer, um, queer theory um, and the Middle Ages. And that brings us then to section six, um, a non-linear Dante. So for, for a very long time, the tendency has been um, usually to read Dante's texts in a teleological fashion, um, to try and close them into, you know, somewhat of a totalizing framework, this idea that tout se tient, so that everything can somehow hold together, um, often through recourse to concepts that are articulated in, in, in the chapter on conversion, palinody and traces. So thinking about penitence, about um, you know, recantation, this idea of radical transformation and progress. But recently, scholars have, have come to recognise that Dante's texts are more complicated um, and they're replete with, with tensions. Um, and that there's, you know, that, that there is certainly a sort of centripetal drive towards unity, towards um, sort of moving towards a kind of end point and a teleology. But there are also more centrifugal forces which complicate um, and unsettle um, and can un unsettle that narrative. And so this section really like tries to sort of it really unearths and, and explores some of these tensions in Dante's texts, including in the Commedia, um, and, and sort of shows how that there's not a perfect and a coherent unity, but rather the text acts as kind of complex systems that also include doubts, errors, slips, um, unresolved tensions and paradoxes. And these contradictions and these, these paradoxes uh, you know, some of which just cannot be resolved, often turn out to be some of the most interesting parts of, um, of, of Dante's works. And here I'm going to move on now to the last section, and I will hand over to Lele. Lele, say muto. Sorry, thank you, Francesca, and hi, everybody. Grazie, Lele. Uh, sorry, uh, on my screen, I cannot see the new slide maybe it's only me whether you know the slide with the new section yeah it's only you 
Okay, it's only me. Okay, it's good that you can see. So, like, it, it's it's the last section I'm going to talk about, which is called uh, Nach Leben, and it's uh, indebted to uh, the art historian Abi Warburg's concept precisely of Nach Leben, which literally means life after death, and which draws out the vitality of Dante's earth over the centuries. The idea here is that the manifold appropriations of Dante's work whether uh, through translations, reimaginings, or allusions or adaptations, are not merely forms of rewriting Dante or transmitting him, but actually allow Dante's text to reveal new meanings and to express fully their latent potentiality, actualizing it in the present and giving a sense of Dante's continued presence in worldly literature. So this, this section, in a way, presents itself as a sort of window into the world. And the Dante that emerges is not restricted by any national border, but is a worldly, again, plural, and above all, open uh, to a dialogue with the most up-to-date critical theory, such as gender study, uh, post and the colonial studies or race studies and you can i cannot see but you can see the uh, um, the essays in the session so like it begins with one on a translation then it moves to the performing arts uh cinema it's a screen but you know this piece is mainly on cinema modernism uh, and then uh, i will just uh, uh, say that you know like as you can see from this overview uh, the the volume that emerges is uh, rather different from what one usually sees in companions or handbooks that are divided by chronology or uh, uh, sections dedicated to the individual works. We left uh, our uh, contributors with the freedom to follow their own method, scientific interest and style, and often we also push them outside of their comfort zones, and we are very grateful for those who have accepted precisely to, to move into new uh, territories. Uh, the only thing that we asked was that they wrote a text that remained open and in dialogue. In other words, that did not claim to give the definitive word on a particular topic, but could spark questions and conversations. And obviously, you know, uh, in line with the purity of the handbooks, the chapters needed to be aimed at a cultured, but not necessarily specialist audience. Uh, the topics were chosen so that individual contributors didn't come to be concentrated on only one period of Dante's life or one dimension of uh, his work or just one particular methodology. As editors, we also entered often and willingly into dialogue with our authors. And in many cases, the chapters went in unexpected directions, both for the authors and for us. The result is, we think, a rich and multidisciplinary volume, which offers an experience of reading that is not linear, but instead is founded on encounters, including unexpected ones, interferences, contaminations, and also voids. The reader does not find a definitive path to the handbook, but rather the possibility to move about the text, constructing their own list of chapters, which encounter one another through cross-references, resonances, and echoes. In other words, there are many paths that a reader can take to the handbook, and we hope that the reader can take pleasure, pleasure in the journey, seeing the beauty of encountering a diversity of thought and perspectives, ideas, effervescing, colliding, and often intermingling, with any single chapter potentially open up to any number of other chapters, distant or contiguous as they may be. So to close, we thought we would give you just a few examples of what a reader can find and to focus precisely on the final section, Nach Leben, and on the four last essays. And you, we, Again, we apologize in advance for to the contributors to simplify their argument, which, as in the case of all the other chapters, is very uh, complex. But we wanted to try to communicate uh, something of the remarkable scholarship of at least a few chapters. So like I will begin with 41, Dante and the Shoah by Lino Pertile, 
And uh, uh, Francesca, maybe you can show the next uh, slide, which I cannot see, but you will probably, I hope you will see. It. So like this chapter is particularly uh, important insofar as it distinguishes two very different appropriations of Dante. One by the fascist regime, uh, to the extent that, as I hope you can see, you know, like there is, uh, uh, Dante was appropriated and it's the cantos of Caccia Guida as a way to support Il Manifesto della Razza. And you can see on the picture, the kind of like stereotype of the classical uh, Aryan beauty from the Greek past and the stereotypes of, you know, like the Jewish and the African identity. So like uh, on the one hand, uh, Dante could be appropriated in order to uh, uh, support fascist ideology of race. On the other hand, Pertile gives a fantastic, moving and really beautiful reading of what, as you know, Primo Levi does with Dante in the Canto of Ulisse, where the transgression that inspires Levi is really that, in a way, the possibility to challenge the laws of the lager and for a moment to recover his own human identity. So like this was uh, a very, this is a very interesting chapter for us to show how, you know, like Dante can really convey very, can be appropriate in very different ways. The, the, the following chapter, Dante in Caribbean Poetic Language, Power, Power and Race, is also uh, very interesting and situates first the reception of Dante in the Caribbean in relation to the Afro-American reception of Dante. And it's very interesting what Jason does in distinguishing how Dante is also appropriated differently with respect to race and to language in the Caribbean and in the Afro-American community in the United States because history is different and the fact that the history is different marks a different relationship with uh, language and the, the, the metropole in a way. So like first, uh, uh, the author situates the reception of Dante in the Caribbean and then shows uh, and then focuses on the works of two Jamaican poets where we have, who have engaged with Dante, Kamau Brathwaite and Lorna Goodison and also uh, uh, dwells into the uh, complexity of the relationship between the, the Creole and language in the Caribbean and the British English of, you know, London. Uh, and I don't know, like a, a few days ago on, on the 12th May, uh, Lorna Goodison came to speak uh, about her experience of a poet who in the Caribbean uh, lets herself be inspired by Dante and what Dante meant for her. The, 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 the following section is uh, called Queer in Dante by Gary Cestaro. And this uh, chapter shows how a thread of homoerotic desire is not only present, as we all know, in the episode of the Sodomite in Inferno or of the Last Fall in Purgatory, but actually through also the mediation of Virgil also flows in other episodes of the Commedia that have to do with uh, uh, pedagogy and the kind of uh, erotic relationship involved in the transmission of knowledge. And then it uh, explores how the non-normative potential of Dantean eros has been picked up and, re and uh, uh, relaunched by queer authors like Oscar Wilde, Walt Whitman, W.H. Uh, Auden, Pierpaolo Pasolini, and uh, Mario Mieli. And the final, the final essay uh, with which we are very happy to uh, conclude, I will uh, let uh, Elena speak about it. Thank you, thank you, Lele. And I, yes, I will um, conclude with the example of a of a very very special essay, the essay that concludes our volume, um, uh, that was written by a friend and longtime collaborator of ours who sadly passed away last year, Margaret Waller. Uh, Margie was a truly 
radical feminist scholar, a scholar who had really an impressive breadth in her production, the span from Dante to, to Fellini to modern cinema, but not only in the production, but really in her way of thinking, not only chronologically, but also spatially. Um, she, she was a, a, a really generous, uh, um, engaged and engaging academic and activist and a truly sophisticated thinker. And she, she gave us, as, as a gift really, um, this, this wonderful uh, last essay um, entitled A Decolonial and Feminist Dante, Imperial Historiography and Gender, as you can see. And, and in this essay, we really have a, a beautiful example of that <clears throat> freedom of, of thought and, and scholarship that we talked about uh, um, in, in the way uh, in which Waller put together feminist and the colonial perspective in a reading of Dante to understand better uh, Dante's view on gender. So, for instance, uh, Waller uh, looks at how early Christian art, specifically the frescoes in the church of Santa, Santa Prassede in Rome, um, challenge the ancient and even the future imperial and imperialist uh, ideas and norms. And then she traces some similarity between these um, uh, practice and eh? of, of uh, early Christian art and the way in which Dante constructs the figure of Beatrice. Now, it is not a question of sources. Uh, clearly, Dante does not inspire himself directly from Santa Prassese, even if he did perhaps visit um, Rome during the Jubilee and potentially saw this art. It, and more importantly, is not a question of what comes before, what comes after, what is better, what is worse. But it is precisely, as we have wished for our volume, a question of dialogues, of interferences, um, of, of collaborations in which our modern interest can be placed in the sky as that of the ancients and form there a new constellation. So our handbook is actually dedicated to Margie Waller and to friendship, um, the friendship between the three of us and uh, the others that have taken shape uh, through the years with so many people, um, precisely thanks to these intellectual dialogues we have with them, uh, dialogues that continue to happen even when they are no longer with us. And I thank you very much. So thank you very much to all three of you um, for that very rich overview. Um, we're going to move on to a Q&A session now. So just ha back to housekeeping, sorry. Um, if you want to ask a question, um, so up next to the three dots, you'll see a little emoticon with this hand up. So just um, click on that and there's a raise your hand button. Um, and then I'll call upon you to ask your question um, once you have unmuted your microphone. Um, so while we're waiting for people to to think up the very imaginative questions. I just wanted to ask a question of my own, uh, which is I love that you finish your introduction with that image of Dante um, at just about to enter into the earthly paradise um, at the end of Poetry 27. And I was thinking about the fact that one of the most striking things about the earthly paradise is that it's full of surprises. You know, it's not at all what you're expecting when you get there. You know, the, the Beatrice that we meet in Purgatory 30 is not the Beatrice we're expecting. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, you know, what surprises did you have as you were, both as you were putting the volume together, but also what surprises do you think are there for a reader that they might not expect in a project of this nature? I mean, you've obviously just touched on some of the, the maybe less canonical approaches at the end. So that's my very open, open question to you all. I don't know. May I? Sure, of course. I, 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 I don't know. Maybe uh, I don't know. Like the hope, as in the, you know, like what we were saying, you know, like what was for us important 
about concluding with the passage where, you know, like uh, uh, Dante is finally, in a way, uh, given the freedom to wander with pleasure. I mean, that's, that was mainly the hope, you know, like that we, that, that, that we, that, that, again, the, the hope that we have that readers may uh, find the handbook as a space to, uh, uh, where uh, scholars, very serious scholarship, you know, like uh, encounters uh, uh, pleasure and freedom. So maybe uh, like uh, that, that's, I think, what, what that image like uh, uh, try to, to, to convey, the, the sort of like not, not being afraid to let oneself go astray or somewhere else or like not necessarily uh, linearly. But, but maybe Francesca and Elena, you have like something more uh, direct uh, related to the question too. Uh, no, absolutely. I think you, you're right. The hope was precisely to have uh, a, a reader who is uh, free to, to, to wander uh, in our book a little bit, uh, like Dante does in, in the Paradiso Terrestre. Um, and the surprises that we had were really many. Um, uh, and all positive. It's been an extraordinary, um, uh, an extraordinary being in touch with uh, Dante's scholarship and with uh, uh, with amazing scholars, um, all of whom so generously have uh, um, have participated to this this project that was not linear or easy. I mean, very often we have asked, um, we have put people very much outside of their comfort zone and uh, and uh, our collaborators have been delighted to do that and uh, um, they, they, they have produced uh, um, really, really amazing essays, really amazing uh, pieces. So, 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 so the surprises have been really really throughout um and uh, and have made this journey i i i find in the end uh, very very light very um very pleasant elena if i just may correct that it's funny how memory works you know, <laughs> because there were certain moments where there were we were really like overwhelmed by you know like the, the amount of because then that's sort you know those of you who have edited books then there are certain moments in the pro in in the process where everything is putting a lot of pressure so but it's true that, you know like what remains is the knowledge the, the the surprises and also like yeah the pleasure certainly yeah but light i'm not sure <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Caroline Dormer. Hiya, um, I'll just lower my hand maybe as well. Um, I'll do that afterwards. Um, I was particularly struck by um, this image of a, a vulnerable Dante. I thought that was um, really fantastic. And I was wondering if while you were sort of working on this project, if you'd sort of reflected on why maybe Dante is uh, an author who's not typically seen as being vulnerable. And I think this is something you mentioned in the introduction as well, is that if you compare it with Shakespeare, for example, whose authorship has been challenged in many ways, why hasn't this happened with Dante? And why has there been this reluctance to see some of these um, voids, as you put it, or the um, the interferences or the errors in the text? Is it simply because the Commedia can be seen as quite a controlling text in some way? Or did you think there was something more to it? Well, it, it Dante, uh, not since the beginning, but as we know, since the 1290s, uh, takes, it in, takes it in his hands uh, to control uh, um, his work. Uh, and uh, this is, un I mean, this is uh, undeniable uh, with the Vita Nuova um, and then with the Convivio, with the De Vulgar Eloquenza, with the Commedia. There's, there, there is, uh, I mean, we are not denying that there is this sort of forward push on the part of Dante himself. The fact that uh, very often this is not recognized as a fiction, but somehow Dante's, uh, Dan Dante and his early commentators um, 
somewhat rigid uh, uh, direction given to uh, his works um, have, you know, make these seem, have made it seem like the truth, and so much so that we take his bibliography for a biography. Um, and, and, and we take for as true everything he says. Um, and is is extraordinary. I mean, I, I don't think in, in um, I don't think there is another author that strikes with the reader such a pact, so tight. Like, believe me, follow me, and, and it's wonderful to um, strike that pact with Dante and to follow him, as long as we remember that we've given the consent, and that this is a fiction, that we're following a fiction, that we're not following a reality. So this is why it's difficult to undo. Huh? But Dante tells us so many times, uh, for example, um, that macro that I was talking about uh, comes just after the poema sacro cui am posto nano cele terra, the sacred poem to which heaven and earth, and we always focus on those lines that are just like these big trumpets of I think Dante himself put me on hold. <laughs> and then the next line we read che m'ha fatto per molti anni macro. We read the exhaustion, the sheer exhaustion. And we tend not to look at that. So this is my answer, but probably Lele and Francesca want to add something here. No, I mean, I would absolutely agree. I mean, I find also, you know, even when one is teaching, you know, if I teach the Duecento and I'm teaching things other than Dante, other today, I mean, you you come back to Dante so often as a reference point, and it's well known that, you know, the way that we even read, and, and this is something that, you know, one can also see, the way we read what becomes a kind of genealogy of lyric from the Sicilians through, like, the Steen novel to Petrarch, I mean, that is often, you know, the way that we frame that, it's just you know, the way that Dante kind of lays that out for us, I mean, even the term Dolce di Novo comes from Purgatorio, right? So it's also this quite, I mean, I think it's everything that Ellen was saying. I mean, on the one hand, it's it's there and it's it's there to be kind of, if you want to, you take it. Um, it's actually quite a seductive way of kind of understanding because it seems to be, you know, so suggestive as a, as a narrative. But then there is also this way in which one can precisely like think of, but how is that in the way that we were talking about this, this sort of the operation of the Vita Nova that there is a sort of textual strategy and that this is there's this kind of performative like dimension of staging certain things and then when one like looks to that dimension something else opens up that is precisely like less stable less fixed less necessarily kind of like everything holding together and you get these like sort of interstices and and things that can, you know, really be interesting to think about. Um, so I think that that, but Lily may want to add something. Who's, you know, you've really thought about many of these things too. Yeah, maybe maybe I can only add that. On the one hand, it was a way to not to give the consent of which Elena was saying, and allowing ourselves to enter into the complexity of textuality and the way in which texts work, and so precisely to acknowledge the tensions and without seeing them, without, uh, you know, like not seeing them because Dante wants to erase them, you know, not because of the, you know, like Nicolau would call the master narrative that he creates. So like on the one hand, for us, it was attention and care to the text. On the other hand, and maybe I speak more of myself, but I, Elena and Francesca also agree, I mean, it, it's a service that we gave to Dante. You know, because in a way, by opening in half, by opening, by showing that these, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, corazza uh, or armor uh, that people tend to assign to him is very dangerous. I mean, it doesn't make him a particularly, I don't know, uh, uh, appealing author. So like in a way, yeah, we, 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 we try to, uh, uh, we, we were thinking that by, make, by opening Dante to other perspectives, 
and to a dialogue that we have tried to create it like we were actually uh, doing a service to Dante himself. That in, 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 you know, like in our world, vulnerability is clearly a very positive concept, you know, that we wanted to, in a way, uh, you know, with Butler, with Cavarero, I don't know, with a lot of precisely feminist and, you know, uh, thinking, uh, we wanted to, in a way, uh, allow ourselves to, to show that vulnerability in, uh, in, in Dante. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments? Okay, maybe while the creative juices are flowing, I might ask another question. Um, so you write in your introduction that the categories that you divide the essays into is one configuration and you would encourage people to think about other configurations as well. So I was just wondering how early on in the process those came into being or were they something that were, um, were they developed as you sort of encountered the material? They were developed at the beginning before we encountered any material. Yes. But I, then they were, yeah, but they were quite fluid though, because yes. I remember a passionate selfhood was still being like we were really thinking around. I think some of them, yeah, I think some of them we continued to kind of work. Absolutely. But you're right that we had the, the sort of overall idea was there for and then it kind of also thinking about how to put them together I think that's right that we then sort of came back to that it was sort of the working the working framework and then kind of yeah, it back. also it also changed you know like we had to write a proposal that was commented and commented over and over again so like there was a very clear st structure which then we modified also on the basis of what the chapters ended up being because we, did, we didn't know, so like, you know, like, that's why we say that, you know, the individual chapters have really affected, you know, the, not only the, in themselves, but really like the, the whole of the whole volume. Yeah. Um, we've got a question from Rebecca Bowen. Hi, ciao a tutti, mi sentite? Is that okay? Um, you've spoken so beautifully about um, the openness uh, fostered in the scholarship in this volume and I was wondering if you could speak maybe just briefly um, to highlight the kind of effect that you hope that this piece of work might have moving forward as well with on to scholarship with younger scholars um, you know the effect of the volume well I think what we, I, I think this volume is, uh, I mean, with, without exaggerating or anything, but it is a little bit a statement uh, in the field of Dante studies. And I, and we, we hope, uh, you know, this is a statement that is there and can be entered into discussion and we can, and can enter into dialogue. I mean, when we say we are in dialogue, we mean it. It's not just we are in dialogue, but we are not in dialogue. Like, you know, many people <laughs> say we are we are in dialogue and uh, and, and and we hope this this conversation continues for uh, for a bit. We thought it was uh, it, it was due. It was due to bring a vulnerable Dante uh, in the year of the anniversary um, to to the fore. Um, and uh, we do hope that uh, younger scholars feed on 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 this. Um, but you know, mostly we we hope to have conversations. The uh, the conversations that we have had throughout the volume, uh, throughout the making of the volume, and after the making of the volume um, have been really transformative. And so I I, I hope they keep on being such well one one hope that i have is that uh, it fosters curiosity towards not towards what one does not do 
because there are, it is so plural, there are so many perspectives that we have really tried to put together in the single volume. And what I hope is that, you know, like people will be uh, fascinated by the possibility of going beyond oneself. And, you know, like that's also the part of the curiosity and the, the, the idea of putting together this, this plurality is uh, the constant movement without fixing oneself on also like one in one's own position. So like, you know, like maybe my, my hope is that dialogues, also curiosity and get to know what other people are doing or thinking may become uh, more of a praxis. Yeah, and I think picking up from what Lillian and Ellen have said, I mean, it's also that, I suppose it comes back to that idea that it wasn't meant to be a definitive word on something. I mean, there was really this idea of trying to, you know, give something that was, you know, could spark that intellectual curiosity, could really, you know, allow you to think through incredibly complex things. But this idea that that is an invitation, as as both Ellen and Lilla were saying, to further thinking and, and consideration and, 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 and dialogue, um, and that maybe that can be, you know, also in terms of how how we do kind of, you know, we approach our, our work and our thinking and to be receptive, I suppose, the receptivity thing that, you know, we also see in, in some of Dante's works, this idea of, you know, really trying to kind of both acknowledge other, you know, and existing voices, but also be able to somehow then, you know, make something out of that bringing things together um, that wouldn't happen if you're that lone sort of voice. Um, so, you know, maybe that could be a way to think of, yes. of thinking with others in a way. Um, so, yeah, I would agree absolutely with Ellen and Lily. Thank you so much. And thank you, Lily, for using the word hope as well. I feel like I should have put that in my question. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. OK, do we have any any other comments or questions? If also contributors want to share their experience, you know, like that would all, that everybody's really very welcome with no pressure at the same time. Yeah, uh, Peter Hainsworth. I think I've unmuted. Uh, thank you very much for that really good introduction to your volume, which sounds really interesting, and I'm looking forward to reading it as soon as I've saved up £125. Um, it is quite a costly volume, but anyway, that uh, is LUP, not you. Um, anyway, I, I, it sounds re really good. I like the idea of dialogue and approaching Dante from different angles. I just wonder whether you have left with a view also that Dante could be a, a difficult author for some readers, a difficult author in the sense that his whole uh, approach to particular topics might be just unacceptable. And the obvious readers here, from that point of view, if they exist, are um, Islamic readers. And I think Islamic readers will find Dante still a, a, an author who it's difficult to swallow, particularly in his treatment of Muhammad. Um, it, well, and I'm just pointing to that, is thinking that Dante has got some things in him which are very definitely rebarbative as far as a large section of the world reading population is concerned. And I'm not sure that if you're um, living in Tehran, uh, Afghanistan at the moment, whether you would be willing to enter into kind of dialogue with Dante and dialogue with lots of other people about Dante, because there are certain things that Dante does which stick in your craw from uh, the moment that you encounter what he says. Do, 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 does that aspect of Dante of, of being a, a difficult author to accept for at least a large number, of, uh, uh, for a proportion of the world's population, come into your thinking or your approach at all? May, may, may I begin? Because it's something that I've been thinking so much about. You know, like, uh, and uh, I don't know, for me, I am not 
like a Muslim, but there are certain things that bother me of Dante enormously. He can be misogynistic, he can be homophobic, he can be, you know, like there, are, there have also been some very anti-Semitic reading of mm. Dante. You know, like, and that's what I meant that we were trying to do a service when we would show that actually not everything in Dante does lead to the Manifesto della Razza, even though there are certain things that do and that it is important to acknowledge that they do. But in relation to, you know, like maybe, maybe it's something that if maybe we have under, understood retrospectively what, what we did, but in terms of like the, the, the Arabic culture, we have a chapter which is called the Mediterranean. And there it's about how Arabic culture has influence, influence not only the, mid, the Western Middle Ages, but Dante himself. So that's what we were saying. The Dante that we wanted also to show was a receptive Dante. So it, for us, it was important to show what, you know, like Arabic culture did on Dante, how in a way, you know, like he let himself, you know, be affected and fascinated by it, you know, like, which doesn't mean to negate. And I think that Edward Said's reading of Mohammed, I don't know, like it is Orientalist and it is, you know, I can see that it can disturb people, but in a way, we also wanted to acknowledge that that exists. And, you know, that's why I think that, you know, it's very important that Pertile's essay is there, especially because it is speaking about, maybe we should have also had a chapter on colonialism, on Italian colonialism. You see what I mean? But, you know, like, but our, when we say a vulnerable Dante, our way to rescue Dante is to show, in this case, how Arabic culture has affected him. You know, like how, you know, like, you, do you see what I mean? So like our move was that to move towards vulnerability rather than aggression or affirmation or all of these, you know, like other words that are usually or often also now associated with Dante because they are also there. Yeah. Yeah. And also, if I may add, uh, uh, the volume is really very much about reading and readings and the importance of readings. Uh, so to those readers, if I could, I would say, do read Dante and transform it with your readings because reading is transformative. That, that's all I, I, I would and, and, and reading is transformative for me for all the things that I don't like in Dante and many other authors, but uh, you just have to keep on readings and, and readings over the centuries, they layer after layer after layer and, and they go in so many different directions. And then, you know, and there is Primo Levi who reads Dante and, and is extraordinary. There is, uh, there is Lorna Goodison who reads Dante and is extraordinary. And what they see in there is Levi doesn't see the Manifesto della Razza. Lorna Goodison doesn't see the imperialism. So there are layers and layers of reading. It's not about sheltering Dante for what he and his culture did wrong, but actually opening up and and yes, and, and having the, the courage to transform. That's yeah. what I think is important. And I'm not saying our volume <laughs> teaches that <laughs> entirely, but I think it is inspired to that a little bit. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Uh, yeah, we've got a question from Stefano Yossa. Ciao a tutti. Um, to what extent are you aiming at a new commentary of Dante's Divine Comedy? I ask this because I've got the impression that you're challenging existing commentaries, in particular with their usually very erudite and explanatory approach in particular in the English language. And therefore, I feel that your handbook might be a means to construct a new commentary uh, in that it leads naturally towards a new commentary, 
basically written by the three of you, I hope. So this is an invitation, basically, rather than uh, a question. And uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about this idea of challenging the existing commentaries as well with your handbook. Thank you so much for this presentation, which was great, by the way. <laughs> Oops, I don't know. Am I still on? Yes, just just very briefly. I mean, uh, one thing that we have tried definitely is not to be too comedia centric if such a word exists. So if, if ever there is an ideal commentary in there is that uh, much of Dante, much, much, much interest is outside of the comedia. Uh, so uh, I think that's one thing, no? Certainly that I could say. Um, yeah, and maybe the idea that in this sort of sense of like openness and trying to have this plural, this plurality, that it wasn't ever really a case of trying to also overwrite other things. It was more this idea of somehow managing to perhaps add to that, you know, to, to sort of offer kind of this alternative that then you know, we hope our readers can then themselves critically think, well, actually, you know, I've read all these different, the, all these, you know, as, as Elena was talking about these sort of plural readings and then think about how you negotiate between what, as we know, actually, what's so fascinating about often Dante commentary is that you can have the same passage and it's just understood in really, even in, in, in very different ways, right? And I think what I've always found also fascinating is this sort of sense of then having to, keep going back to the text and maybe I suppose you know maybe this is also in being a handbook I mean maybe that's also one thing that it is this idea that you also are invited maybe to keep going back to Dante's texts and you know read again and, and maybe in that sense the reader also may have a role in I mean I, I can't really imagine I suppose I didn't really think personally that I had the sort of the aspiration towards a but it's interesting if that were something that could come out as a kind of but yeah thank you it's an interesting thing to think about Lily might want to come in I mean just to add that I don't feel I would have the knowledge to do a commentary certainly not of Dante's oeuvre but also like of the comedian I mean, the incredible amount of knowledge that is in the handbook is only very partially produced by us you know, like, you know, like we contributed with one hour little essay each, you know, like, so I, I really think that I have learned a lot, you know, but it's, it's again, a sort of receptive knowledge, you know, like I, I have learned a lot because the essays also have taught me that clearly we also elaborate knowledge, not as clear, but, you know, like, but the, it's the, 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 the great amount of knowledge of the handbook is given by the careful work of, of, of like of, of specialists of yeah, maybe that was the greatest privilege that we had as editors was to be able to read all of these essays because we did all three of us read all of them sometimes more than you know a few times and really that that sort of sense of that encounter with all these really like wonderful pieces that then we saw, you know, and, and we were allowed, you know, that the contributors would also invite us to dialogue and, and think and, you know, engage with that at different stages of the process was really quite a remarkable thing and would be hard to replicate outside, you know, because of that, just the sheer also, as, as they said, like just how much we could learn from that um, and and what that, you know, allowed us to, to do really. So again, we just, you know, we really want to recognize and thank all of our authors for that.